sanctuary. I'm not Pastor Thavidi, by the way. <laughs> um, but Pastor T is right here. He is from North Carolina, the barbecue capital of the world. Um, and he has pastored and eldered at churches there and in DC and the Cayman Islands. And he is currently pastor at Anacostia River Church in Southeast DC. Um, and like I said last night, his favorite animal is the Black Panther before the movie came out. Just want to make that clear to everyone. But join me in giving him a warm Scots welcome. I had to pay her for that introduction. How y'all doing this morning? Good, good to see you this morning. Thank you for ordering a little sunshine. Um, I appreciate that. The fog was interesting to wake up to yesterday. I, I was thinking, as I was waking yesterday morning, what, what time does the sun rise here? You know? And uh, when outside, I was like, oh, it's the fog. And so I, I appreciate you guys ordering a little sunshine. Next time, order sunshine with the heat, okay? <laughs> with the warmth. So, anywho. Well, uh, again, thank you for having me here for this time together in God's Word, thinking about what it means to be in the image of God and having that instruct how we understand ourselves and how we live in the world. And uh, I just want to pick up from where we started yesterday by directing our attention to Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to be considering verses 20 to 24. And as you turn there, let me remind you of where we began yesterday. In yesterday's chapel, we attempted to do two things. Number one, to sort of trace the theme of the image of God throughout the Bible, from creation all the way to consummation. And number two, to meditate on one aspect of what it means to be in the image of God uh, as we think about Christ's redemption. And that aspect that we considered yesterday was knowledge, that to be renewed in the image of God and his likeness in Christ means to be renewed in knowledge after our creator. Well, this morning and tomorrow morning, we want to add one additional thing to that notion of the image of God. And this morning, we want to continue thinking about this ongoing work of Christ's redemption in our life by adding something from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to, 4, 20 to 24. It's a text that's largely parallel to Colossians 3 um, in its main metaphor, but it extends Colossians 3 in an important way. So look with me there as I read Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 24. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. As we look at these four verses, I want us to sort of outline our thinking with sort of three sections here. First, we want to observe the, the assumption that the Bible makes here in verses 20 and 21. Secondly, we want to consider the attitude that the Bible calls us to in verses 22 and 23. And then finally, we want to consider the action of verse 24, the assumption, the attitude, the action. Let's pray together. Father, indeed, we pray that you would help us to see Jesus in your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to become what we see. Give us a, a great vision of his glory and his majesty and draw us up into it, conform us to it more and more, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the assumption here, you'll notice in verse 20, the Bible makes an assumption about the Ephesian readers and an assumption about us as readers. It assumes that we have, notice there, learned Christ. It's a wonderful phrase. This idea to, to learn a person, this is the only place that it occurs in the Bible, 
In fact, as far as we know, this phrase or this idea of, of learning in a person doesn't occur anywhere in Greek literature before the Bible. When we have learned something, we have we've welcomed it, we've studied and observed it, we have applied it, right? This is what your professors expect from you in the classrooms, to, to hear it, to welcome it, to understand it, to apply it in some meaningful way. And so to do that, the text here says that a person, if they are to learn Christ, then they have, number one, heard about him, and number two, were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. In other words, the, the Christian is someone who has heard and believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the gospel, Jesus has changed their life. They have become disciples enrolled in his school, and they have learned to live in a way that's consistent with who Jesus is. So here in the gospel, beloved, it's not a passive activity. We just go along with a story or merely give intellectual assent. No, to hear the gospel in a saving way, we must under, understand and believe that Jesus is God the Son, that, that he took on human flesh and lived an earthly life, that he obeyed the Father perfectly, that he became the sinless Lamb of God who dies in the place of sinners and takes away the sins of the world. That he was crucified and buried and three days later raised from the grave. That he ascended to heaven where he now sits in the place of honor at the right hand of the Father. And that he is spiritually united to himself, all who come to him in faith. And that he's coming again to gather his church and to bring his people into that eternal kingdom that he promised. I mean, to hear the gospel in a saving way, we are meant to believe and understand and live our lives according to the fact that Christ is Lord of all creation, including us. That he is our righteousness before God. That, that he is the object of our worship and really our highest happiness. And that one day, we'll give an account to him for how we've lived, and we will enter into that eternal reward. Now, Paul assumes this about the Ephesians, but he, but he states it in, in, in so many words so that they, they don't take this truth for granted, this having learned Christ and heard the gospel and been instructed by the gospel, they, they don't take that for granted. They don't assume it in an improper way. There are good ways and bad ways to assume things. The bad ways assume a thing in such a way that you go on to forget it and it never sort of affect your living and your thinking. The good way to assume something is a lot like the mathematician who, who understands and assumes that one plus one always equals two. and builds the rest of his mathematical work on those sort of basic math facts. Or like the physician, or the, excuse me, the physicist who assumes that um, an object, because of gravity, will always fall to the earth un unless it's acted upon by a different force. But that law of gravity sort of structures his entire enterprise as a physicist. In that way, we, we are rightly, in a good way, assuming facts and truths. And so it is with Christ. That the Christian is one who assumes the, the centrality and the importance and the and the life-defining reality of who Jesus is and what he's done and how he's at work in our lives. So the question for us is, is that how we live? Do we assume and accept the truth of Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and resurrected? Is that the defining reality of our lives? Have we learned Christ in such a way that he animates our decision making, our feeling, our thinking, our doing? Beloved, let me exhort you, if you learn nothing else at Covenant College, and really before you learn anything else, learn Christ. Learn him this way. Study him. Observe him. Welcome him, understand him, believe upon him, and follow him. 
That's what the text assumes. And, and based on that assumption now, it encourages us toward a, a particular attitude. Notice um, what the text addresses in terms of our attitude. It calls us, number one, to put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through its deceitful desires. That's the, the old person, the man of sin. His desires are corrupt, which is why we ought never trust the human heart, the fallen heart. His desires are corrupt. Its manner of life is corrupt. Its habit was sinful. When we have come to Christ and we have learned Christ, we have decisively put that old man off. And then the text goes on to say we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. We spoke a bit about this yesterday in different terms when we talked about being renewed uh, in knowledge after, after our creator. We refer to Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're to do that, that constant renewal work of, of, of changing our minds and addressing the, the, the course and the habits of our, of our soul in that way. Then number three, the third infinitive we get here is we to, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now those three infinitives there, sometimes they, they have the force of a command, of an, impairment, of an imperative, as if this is something we're to do, but I think more properly we're to understand that these are actually facts about us. That if we are Christians, we have already decisively put off the old man. And if we are Christians, this work of renewing our minds, the spirit of our minds, has actually already begun. And if we are Christians, we have decisively already put on the new self. We put on Christ. We are new creations. The old has passed away. The new has come. According to this text, that's what we were taught in Christ. We've been taught once and for all to make this break with the old and to live in the new. So our attitude should be to think of ourselves in this way, as having left that old life and began a new life. And what is really marvelous about this text, look at it with me, is that we've not put on new clothes. We've put on a, a person. We've put on Jesus. We are robed in him. And maybe that sentence doesn't hit you the way it would hit you if I had a Wakandan accent, right? I need to trill the R, right? We are robed in him. We are clothed in him. We are growing in him, this new self. Notice, this is our theme, created after the likeness of God. We should say a couple of quick things about this. Number one, God is the one who creates this new man. This is not a matter of self-effort. This is not a matter of um, going to your self-help shelf in your bookstore and, and picking out something on how to be a, a better person or a new person, however helpful those things may be in their place. This is a divine creative project. God is making us new. And notice, secondly, God is the pattern or the model of this new creation in us. We are after the likeness of God, which therefore just sort of brings the, the sort of force of the command. We therefore are to be like God, the text says, in true righteousness and holiness. Anthony Hokema writes this on, this on this paragraph. As God was the creator of man in the beginning, so God is also the creator of the new self, or the new man believers have put on. As man was created in the image of God to begin with, so the new self that God has created for us is in accordance with God, or like God. Since the believer is not yet perfect, but must be progressively renewed, verse 23, we conclude that this renewal consists of a growing and ever-increasing likeness to God. Here again we see that the purpose of redemption is to restore the image of God in man. That's staggering. That's what God is doing in your life, beloved, if you're a Christian. That's his purpose. 
to take those of us who were so far from being like God because of our sin and to ever so increasingly and steadily not only to begin the work, but continue the work until he completes it on the day of Christ. You are becoming like God. That's the purpose of your redemption, of your salvation. Not merely to rescue you from the flames of judgment and to add a little morality to your life, but to actually make us new creations, fit to be like our God. This is how we should think of ourselves. This is the attitude the scripture is exhorting us to, to take. It is, it is rightful for us to remind ourselves each morning and each midday and each night after the day's failings and the day's struggles that those failings and struggles don't have the last word. Christ will, and his last word will be likeness, image, conformity to himself. You think of yourself this way? Do you define yourself as a new creation with the old things passed away? Beloved, if you're in Christ, you should. At the very center of how you understand yourself. As a consequence of your university education. Uh, at the heart of, of your self-regard should be this truth about yourself. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation, created and recreated after the image and likeness of God. Think that about yourself. Let that shape your impression of yourself. Let that drive your esteem and your sense of efficacy. Let that be what you build your identity upon, for that is solid rock to stand on. The third thing we want to see in this text then is the action that flows from all of this. We see how Paul assumes that we have learned Christ and what that means in terms of the attitude of taking off the old, putting on the new, and, and constantly being renewed uh, after our Creator. Well, that, that leads very naturally then to a, a kind of action here. What does a new man do? I mean, is it like the man who's having a midlife crisis, who buys a sports car, maybe a toupee and some new clothes? Is that what the new man does? How does a new person live? If we could see the image of God working itself out in the life of a Christian, what would we see? According to verse 24, we would see true righteousness, or you could say righteousness of the truth. If we've been created again after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, this means by implication that part of what we lost in the fall was this true righteousness and this true holiness. That's what's been marred in us. When sin entered the world, that original righteousness left, at least with us. Rather than being upright in all things, humanity is, is bent. Humanity is, is crooked and twisted. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are, all of us, spiritual hunchbacks in that way, misshapen by sin. And we need to be straightened again. We need to be made upright again. We need to have this righteousness restored in us, which is what Christ is doing in us. Now, we said that this is part of what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. And so we might suspect to find these kinds of things said about God himself in the scripture. And, and indeed we do. I'll give you two of my favorite passages of late. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16. There the prophet Isaiah writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. That's glorious. The, the, our God exalts himself in justice. And our God says to us in his word, if we want to know what it's like that he is holy, if we want to know what his holiness is like, he shows his holiness in righteousness. The very terms that we, we see here in Ephesians 4, 24. Or consider Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. 
prophet Moses leading the people out of the Exodus from, from um, bondage in Egypt. They get on the other side, and the first thing Moses does is he writes a song. He breaks out in praise and worship. And the first attributes he comes to in that song of praise to God are attributes that have to do with God's justice and righteousness. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, this is what Moses said. The rock, his way is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. This is the God in whose image and likeness we are created and now recreated. The image of God shows itself in us as we live righteous or just lives. What does that mean? Well, this righteousness here is in relation to our, to our fellow men. It is the, the second table of the law and, and all that that implies. It is how we live in an upright and a just way. In fact, righteousness and justice belong to the same semantic range. They, they belong to the same sort of range of meaning. And the use of the word righteous here really ties together two, two things for us as Christians, the justification with justice. We are justified or declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And apart from that declaration of, of righteousness through faith in Christ, well, none of us are just before God. Not in any saving way. But the person who is so justified by God, because they are now renewed in the image of God, well, they must go on to live a just life before God. And that's the sense we have here in this text. Righteousness, justice, uprightness, integrity, equity as a manner of life, as a lifestyle. So what application might we make of this truth? How might we show forth the image and likeness of God in righteousness? Add it to that knowledge we considered yesterday. Well, let me give you four applications from sort of most specific to more general. Number one, if you're not yet a Christian, beloved, come be made new. Come be a transformed new creation by the hands of God. That's what God offers you in the gospel of his son. Not merely forgiveness, as wonderful as that is. Not merely reconciliation, as needful as that is not merely sort of new moral instruction, as indispensable as that is. He offers you newness to become a new creation in Christ. You need that just as we all have needed that. Come to him. Repent of your sin. Put your faith in Jesus and follow him in the obedience that comes from faith. And your life will be, from that moment on, a life of renewal in the very image and likeness of God. Do you have a higher goal for your life than being like God? Well, come to him for your joy and your fulfillment and trust him. Well, the second application is for us as Christians. Celebrate the fact that in Jesus Christ you are a new creature, created in the likeness of God. I mean, in one sense, there's not a whole lot to do with this except to embrace it and enjoy it and delight in it. It's a marvelous truth that God views you that way and God is at work in your life to, to bring this to, to pass. Don't run past it. Don't, don't forget it. Assume it like the mathematician. Assume it like the physicist. Make this a, a law, so to speak, in, in your thinking and the habit of your mind and in the, in the course of your life that, that you are a new creature. You're not just a new creature. You're a new creature in the image and likeness of the God who loved you and gave his son for you. Delight in that. That's for your joy. Number three, express this new creation with a deep and tight embrace of Jesus and the truth that is in Jesus. Christian people are truth people. We do away with the old life of falsehood and we discover the new and wholesome life of truth. Christ has become 
for us the way, the truth, and the life. So we must walk in him or learn him, him in whom is the truth. And so just as a matter of moral commitment, we need to be dedicated to the truth. Are you committed to the truth? Truth-telling, truth-living in all of life? Which brings us to our fourth application. Let me encourage you to have a, a vision and to pursue a vision of life with Christ that includes the pursuit of righteousness or justice based on the truth. And every Christian ought to have a conception of the good life that includes the pursuit of justice and righteousness based on the truth. Now, the world is crazy with versions of justice. So what we must be sure of is that our justice or righteousness conforms to the, to the truth of the Bible. Truth must lead us to justice. Let me give you an example of how this works. I, I sometimes see proponents of same-sex marriage making the argument that anyone who opposes them effectively denies the image of God in them. And then they go on to claim that because they are in the image of God, justice demands that they be granted the right to marry. I'm simplifying, but those are the sort of major movements of the argument. Now, to take that position, you have to do two things. One, you have to define the image of God in a way that's inconsistent with the moral categories of righteousness and justice. And two, you have to define justice in ways that are inconsistent with the truth. Ephesians 4.24 just does not allow us to do either of those things. Sorry about that. Those proponents of same-sex marriage are not thinking carefully about the imago Dei, the image of God, and how precisely it's shown in a person. Well, be really clear. They are indeed people made in the image of God. That's indisputable, and we ought to affirm it. But to be made in his image and likeness involves us in moral categories and moral behaviors and ethical categories and ethical behaviors that God determines if, in fact, it's his image and likeness that we are being conformed to. So we have to be truth people, and we have to allow truth to inform our definition of righteousness or justice. And what we've just said about same-sex marriage, we could easily say about instances of police brutality or police uh, action. We, we could say about every sort of field of, of, of justice and advocacy, the truth must carry us to justice. To do less than that is to fail to faithfully image forth the God who created us and recreates us in his likeness. So, as we close, do you have a vision for living the rest of your Christian life as someone being created in the likeness of God, pursuing justice and righteousness according to the truth. I hope you do. And I hope all of your education and fellowship here helps to inform and reform that vision for you. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we desire to be like Christ, to be conformed to him, to image forth his greatness and glory, his justice and righteousness. And we can't do this apart from your grace, and so we ask, help us, Lord. Help us fashion a vision that fits who we are and, and where we live and what gifts you're giving us and, and providentially what what lanes in life you allow us to run. Help us to fashion a vision for pursuing your greatness and showing forth your image in righteousness given whom you've made us to be. Give every student wisdom for that and every instructor wisdom for that and do it for the praise of your great name we ask in Jesus' name.